if we want to have a beautiful relationship, but we are wounded still. The inner child is wounded inside of us as adults. What will happen to us? So this is really about inner child and shadow, right? So we, I think people understand that you've got an inner child that maybe didn't get over things that you experienced in your childhood. Shadow is about the parts of yourself that you've rejected because as a young child, you rely on your primary caregivers for survival. Yes. And if there is something that they don't love about you, you want to hide that for all the world so that they will still love you and like not let you die. You don't want anyone to know this about you. No. That's shame. So you hide it away in childhood and often find yourself in adulthood no longer even aware of what those things are because you've rejected them so deeply. Wow. Yeah. And, but that's driving a lot of your unconscious behavior. Right. So if you put together the inner child and the shadow, then what happens is you meet people on the same level of psychological wound as you. Oh, man. You also leave people where if you evolve out of that and they haven't been able to. Wow. Which I think goes back to one of the things, that, one of the pieces of content I heard you talk about, which is like the sense of smell connecting to someone's stress levels or anxiety levels. Like you'll kind of attract a similar nervous system or I guess a certain similar like, I don't know, stress level? Yeah, is that right? so it's not, it's not, not, it's not smell. It's, it's, it's sensing, sensing, not sensing. through smell, the level of the stress hormone, yeah. Interesting. But that's short term, right? But the inner child and shadow stuff is longer term. Gosh, that's fascinating. Yeah. So you think we attract people based on our psychological wounds? 100%. Wow. And as we start to heal and grow, if the other person's not healing and growing, we kind of pull away. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's interesting. Oh, I can see the cogs moving in well, your I just brain. think it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Speaking, I guess, about relationships and men and women, with all of your expertise on the brain, is the process of manifesting love and falling in love different from men versus women? I think if it's love you're really looking for, then it's not different. But not lust. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. The issue is what you're actually looking for. <laughs> Um, so you think men and women manifest love the same way, similar ways? Yeah, I think if, you know, if you want that sense of partnership and friendship and intimacy and you want to be loyal and you want it to be for the long term, then it doesn't matter what gender you are. Mm -hmm. um, but if the, the disconnect is often, and, you know, this is a bit of a stereotype, but usually it's more that men, oh, sorry, that women want a loving, stable relationship and men perhaps, you know, don't want that as want much. Want sex or whatever, yeah. yeah. Or don't, you know, just don't want it right now, but uh -huh. go through periods where that's what they want and go through periods where that's not what they want, which I guess could be true of any gender as well. But overall, more likely women will want to like be in a monogamous relationship. And Why is that based on kind of the brain size? Um, so it comes from evolution. So when we lived in the cave, women did need men to protect them from predators and to hunt for food. So women I guess tend especially if they're pregnant too and they weren't able to go out and yeah. know, hunt or gather or yeah, whatever yeah. it might be. They, I mean, they generally didn't hunt as much, so they gathered more. But then it's hard to get protein from what you gather rather than what you hunt. So, so for survival, and you know, they use the, the, the fat and the skins and everything. So... It wasn't just food, it was shelter and yes. fire and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So although we don't necessarily need a man for those physical things now, it's a very strong wi survival wiring in the brain. And so what we have, you know, in, in the cave, we lived nomadically. So often the men would go and hunt and be away for a very long time. Or if they went far enough and they found a cave of the, of the same tribe, they would just stay there and not go back. Why risk your life to travel back for you know six weeks? Right. But over time, a lot of societies in the modern world have asked people to live in unit families. And so we have seen um, men's brains be rewired. Really? Yeah. So quite re relatively recently, like maybe in the last 10 years, research has showed that when you become a dad for the first time, oxytocin re rewires your brain so that you're more into bonding and less into the testosterone competitive stuff. 
Because if you think about it, lions and tigers, they'll eat their own children. You have to tame that in some ways, right? Yeah. But how do you, how do you tame it, but also harness it in other ways? You know what I mean? It's like mm. a dance of like Mm-mm. having drive and testosterone. Yeah. Like I never want to lose that yeah, drive, I right? <laughs> I get this but question I, all the time. But I also want to be like a great loving parent and yeah. partner and all these things. Yeah. And not let testosterone drive me in doing damaging things, yeah. you know, so. Well, so from about the age of 35, your testosterone will have started dropping significantly already. Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> One's testosterone yeah, tends yeah, to yeah, drop yeah, from yeah. that age. Um, so when you do become a dad. It drops after you become a dad. For the first time. Oxytocin goes up, testosterone drops. You become much more about like cuddling and bonding and wanting to stay in the home and look after the interesting mum and the baby. Less about less about like lifting and like hunting, right? Yeah, interesting. If you keep lifting, then you would actually like keep your keep testosterone levels higher. Also, if the baby sleeps in the same room as you, then your testosterone levels drop even more. Come on. So you might want to move out for three months to oh. a different bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> I've already told her I'm going. I'm getting my sleep. You know, the first few months. So your testosterone drops if you sleep in the same room as the baby. Why is that? Because you're because the oxytocin's becoming like you know higher and higher because you've got this cute little warm thing that smells so nice and is so like vulnerable and dependent on you and it's like in the room with you the, the whole eight hours. You know, of just oxytocin boost. But are women attracted to men with less testosterone? Um, they are when they're not fertile, but they are not when they are at peak fertility. Really? So mid-cycle, when you're ovulating, you're going to want a bad boy. And the rest of the time, <laughs> you're going to want a nice man that will stay at home and help you look after the baby. So if you're not a bad boy when you're at peak fertility as a woman, is that going to hurt the relationship if you don't give women what they want? Hang on, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> So if a man is not a not a bad boy, not a bad yeah. boy yeah. when a woman is at peak fertility mm. and the man just wants to cuddle and chill and not be driven by testosterone and yeah. give the woman that that testosterone feel, yeah. will that ultimately hurt the relationship long term if the woman doesn't get what she wants sexually? I mean, I think if she's chosen him by then. So this is more about when you're like in the choosing phase. Uh-huh. Once you've settled down with someone... Then you have like a logical conversation about are we trying for a baby or not, right? Um, but logic and emotion are two different things. No, I mean, in relationships, is, you know, you might logically say, okay, I'm safe, but emotionally you want something else. This is a reason that people cheat. Right, right, because they're not getting what they want sexually. Yeah, yeah. And so it's like, how do you suppress the thing you want sexually to be like, oh, but he's such a good guy or he's yeah, this yeah. and. But if he's not giving me what I want, then I'm going to go find it from this other younger testosterone-driven <laughs> man, right? You're getting really jealous here. I'm not getting jealous. <laughs> this, this, this fantasy younger high testosterone man. Well, I'm just thinking, is this what women deal with? I know. Is this what women deal with? Yeah, to some extent, you know, more consciously or less consciously, depending on yeah. the woman. Yeah, um, it's interesting, right? So let me kind of explain the physiology behind it from the research that we know the best, yes. which is in um, prairie voles. So there are two types of voles in America, marsh or mountain voles. Voles? What's a vole? Vole. It's a little rat-like creature. Prairie prairie dogs? No. Not prairie it's dogs. It's a vole. It's vole. more like okay. a mouse or a rat. Okay, cool. Yeah. The ones that live in the marsh or the mountain... They have plenty of food and plenty of shelter, and they're super promiscuous. The ones that moved to the prairie, where there's like scarce food and shelter, they snuggle in and settle down and become monogamous for life. The same rat, the same mouse, <laughs> but just living in different areas. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> so, so wait, you're telling me rats are monogamous? These, vo- so- these voles. Oh, these voles are monogamous. The voles are mono- mo- monogamous. Um, if they live in the prairie. If they live in the prairie, but not if they live in the mall. But if they have a, <laughs> but if they have all the food and abundance, they're just and lots of female voles that they can go and visit. They're just little polyamorous voles. Yeah, huh? just... because they know that if they get they get um, you know one vole pregnant and she's left on her own to look after her young, they're going to survive because they're well sheltered. There's plenty of food for her to nip out and bring it back to the babies. Yeah, but in the prairie. If he was promiscuous, 
then the chances of his offspring dying are quite high because she can't defend the nest herself. She can't find enough food for herself and them without help. And so let's extrapolate this. How does this help humans, right? Okay. Well, which first off, which which my, mice are happier? The ones that are more promiscuous or the <laughs> ones that are coupled? <laughs> I think it depends on the on the vol. So you think the the female mice are happy if they just, you know, are pregnant, but then their partner just leaves? No, no. They're not happy. No. How do we know? Can we test that? <laughs> Okay, so how do we apply this no, to no, our hang lives? On, there is an answer to that. Okay. We test it through um, levels of oxytocin and vasopressin. Come on, have we done this? <laughs> have people done this? They've yes. Done, no way. From these mice? Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Um, and actually, just to be serious, the research has done more to help with loneliness, grief, and heartbreak. But obviously, it's got implications for dating wow um so because one of the things that we saw with the receptors in the brain is that like if if i'm in no it's got to be the other way around if you're in love with me you've got more vasopressin receptors in your nucleus accumbens which is on the reward circuitry and then every time you see me you get a reward and the longer that we've been dating and stay together and become closer that reward becomes more intense every time you see me However, if we then had a prolonged separation, time can downregulate the effect of those receptors. So obviously there are implications for that in a breakup or grief, right? Right. Um, and But one of the things I think is like so, so important for dating is that if a woman, if a, if a couple are getting to know each other, and this is all on like heterosexual couples mm -hmm. and research, then as a woman is sexually interested and liking the guy and enjoying the dating, her oxytocin levels is like slowly, slowly starting to go up. When they start actually having sex, she's going to be releasing higher levels of oxytocin every time she orgasms. And that's going to make her bond to the guy much more. If you have sex on the first date, the guy's vasopressin levels will plummet straight away. And all he'll be interested in is testosterone. If you make him wait, his vasopressin and oxytocin levels go up. And then when you do actually have sex, he's already bonded. So it's more likely to become part of a loving relationship. Wow. So if a woman sleeps with a man on the first date or two, mm -hmm. is a man driven to want to bond long term with that person? No. Why not? Because the vasopressin levels drop as soon as he has sex. What does that mean? So vasopressin is the one that makes the prairie voles monogamous. The higher the levels of that, and that the receptors appear in the reward circuitry of wow. your brain. And so basically, if you see your partner in distress, it um, affects your brain, the, the, those neurons, and you want to comfort her through physical touch. Um, so that's oxytocin. But... If you haven't had time for those receptors to appear in the correct place to make you bond, then it's just, it's just, you know, it goes back to lust. So wow. what I say about love and relationships is that the genetics and the receptors will load the gun, but sexual activity will pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. So based on neuroscience, if you sleep with someone quickly, you're less likely to bond long-term together. You're more likely to be promiscuous or just not be as interested in that person long-term. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. <laughs> no. 